Oklahoma City, April 19, 1995. What began as an ordinary day quickly descended into chaos. At 9.02 a.m., a truck bomb ripped through the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building, shredding its nine stories of concrete and steel. The explosion was equivalent to 4,000 pounds of TNT. The shockwave flipped cars like toys, shattering windows over 50 blocks away. It registered as a six on the Richter scale. Within seconds, 168 lives were lost, including 19 children. Over 600 others were injured. Screams of terror and pain filled the streets, drowned only by the wail of sirens and crackling fires. The front of the federal building had been blown outward, as if some monstrous force had torn free from within. Descriptions from first responders are graphic. They encountered torsos and severed limbs among the wreckage, and the suffocating smell of blood hanging in the air. According to one first responder, our firefighters are having to crawl over corpses to get to people that are still alive. It was a nightmare, an open wound in the heart of Oklahoma City. Terry Yakey, a sergeant with the Oklahoma City Police Department, was on duty that morning. Yakey and Jim Ramsey were among the first responders on the scene. Without hesitation, they rushed into the ruins, knowing the building could collapse at any moment. Yakey's bravery would save four lives that day. He carried an unidentified woman from the wreckage, her left leg injured below the knee. He returned to the rubble, spotting an arm jutting out among the debris. He couldn't feel a pulse, and he stormed deeper into the building, following the desperate screams of a man. Tom Hall, a first-floor office worker, had been shredded by shrapnel. His injuries would require over 150 stitches. After carrying Hall to safety, Yakey returned to the man he thought was dead, only to discover he was still alive. Richard Williams, the assistant building manager, had been buried beneath concrete and steel, suffering extensive injuries, fractured skull, severed ear, crushed hand, and torn leg. He dug Williams free and carried him away. Yakey would storm into the ruins once more, helping another first responder who had discovered Randy Ledger. Yakey later recalled rescuing Ledger. All we could see was part of his face. He was completely buried. We couldn't tell where his arms or legs were. We began lifting blocks of concrete off of Randy. He would tell us it hurt as we lifted the chunks one by one. I lifted a board off his face and part of his face peeled back. Finally, we freed Randy and started to carry him out. Ledger had punctured his carotid artery by the time they freed him, he had lost two-thirds of his blood, and he was drifting in and out of consciousness. As Yakey and the other responder carried him to safety, the supports gave way. Yakey plummeted two floors, severely injuring his back. He rode in the same ambulance as Ledger to the hospital. Yakey was heralded as a hero and scheduled to receive the Medal of Valor, but he shunned the attention. His supervisor noted, There are some people that like to be heroes, and some that don't. He was not one that wanted that. Richard Williams, recovering in the hospital, called to thank him personally. He was not comfortable talking, and this didn't help. Yet something was eating away at Yakey. He called his ex-wife for a ride from the hospital, and when she picked him up, he wept openly. He told her that the official story about the bombing was a lie. In the following months, he would conduct his own investigation, collecting photographs, videotapes, and documents. He was convinced that he was under surveillance, and he insisted his investigation was uncovering things he could not ignore. On May 8, 1996, Terry Yakey's body was found in a remote field near El Reno, Oklahoma, just miles from a federal prison. His wrists and neck were slashed, and he had been shot in the head. His blood-soaked car was discovered nearly half a mile away, locked with a razor blade inside. The sheer brutality of his injuries raised questions. 
How could a man gravely injured walk that far? How could he have shot himself from a downward trajectory? Why were there ligature marks on his wrists? Following his death, Yeki's family and friends experienced burglaries, only minor objects displaced or stolen. They heard clicking noises on their phones, and for weeks, they were followed by strange vehicles. What had Yeki uncovered in the months that followed the bomb, and why had that knowledge cost him everything? Timothy McVeigh was born on April 23, 1968, in Lockport, New York. His parents divorced when he was 10, and he primarily lived with his father. He was a withdrawn boy, often bullied, and he had a fascination with firearms and survivalist fantasies. He developed a distrust of authority, and he became radicalized against the federal government. Despite these sentiments, McVeigh joined the U.S. Army in 1988. During basic training at Fort Benning, Georgia, he met Terry Nichols, a fellow recruit nearly 15 years his senior. The two bonded over their rural upbringings and mutual suspicion of government authority, a connection that would turn deadly in the years to come. McVeigh excelled as a soldier, distinguishing himself in his training and later serving in the Gulf War. Yet his experience in the highly structured and hierarchical military only served to reaffirm his anti-authoritarian views, and he left the army in 1991. Upon returning to civilian life, McVeigh struggled to reintegrate. He moved back in with his father, working briefly as a security guard, but quickly found himself feeling isolated and directionless. He began traveling from one gun show to the next, flipping firearms and military memorabilia to get by. These events introduced him to other anti-government extremists who shared his grievances. Around this time, McVeigh revisited his favorite book from high school, The Turner Diaries, a novel that depicted a violent government overthrow through catastrophic bombings. In 1993, McVeigh reconnected with Terry Nichols. Both men had grown more resentful of the government, their anger intensified by events like Ruby Ridge and Waco. At Ruby Ridge in 1992, a federal standoff with survivalist Randy Weaver resulted in the deaths of Weaver's family members. The following year, the federal siege on the Branch Davidian compound in Waco, Texas, left 76 dead. To McVeigh and Nichols, these incidents confirmed their darkest beliefs about government tyranny, and they began planning what they saw as a necessary act of retaliation. In the fall of 1994, the two set their plan in motion, gathering materials to construct an explosive device of unimaginable force. They acquired large quantities of ammonium nitrate fertilizer, ostensibly an agricultural product, but one with lethal potential in the right combination. They mixed it with nitromethane, a volatile racing fuel, and bolstered it with dynamite and blasting caps, which they stole from a nearby quarry. They stored their materials across a series of rented storage units, using aliases to avoid detection, accumulating the parts piece by piece, in quiet anticipation. By April 1995, their preparations were complete. McVeigh had chosen the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building as the target, convinced it symbolized everything he despised. On April 18th, McVeigh and Nichols drove to Geary Lake State Park, a secluded spot near Junction City, Kansas, where they assembled their device. As the waters lapped at the lake's edge, they worked through the day, mixing ammonium nitrate and nitromethane into a lethal compound, carefully loading the substance into 55-gallon barrels. When their work was done, they loaded the barrels into a rider truck McVeigh had rented under the alias Robert Kling. 
arranging the barrels and concealing them under a tarp in the truck bed. In total, the device weighed nearly 5,000 pounds. McVeigh climbed into the truck on the morning of April 18th and drove to Oklahoma City. He spent that night in the truck, parked quietly just outside the city limits, mentally preparing for what would come next. At dawn on April 19th, he drove the Ryder truck to the Murrah building, timing his arrival for 9 a.m. to ensure that the building would be full of government employees and civilians. He set the timed fuses and parked the truck in front of the building's entrance, then walked briskly away. At 9.02 a.m., a shockwave of unrestrained violence broke free, and it seemed to drain the sound from the world. For a single moment, it was deafeningly silent, the air empty of screams and sirens, leaving only an empty crater in its wake. Terry Yakey awoke in the Presbyterian Hospital, attempting to recover from the back injury he sustained while carrying victims from the rubble. His first thoughts weren't of himself, they were of those he had rescued. He managed to reach Randy Ledger, a man he'd saved from the debris, and Yakey later told a reporter, it's like God was directing us together. But after that call, something changed. Terry had been married to Tanya Yakey, and together they had two daughters, but they divorced in April 1994. The following is an interview with Tanya Yakey and hosts Ken Rank and Colonel Craig Roberts, as Tanya recalls the initial aftermath. Well, um... It actually started the day of the bombing that he had made some uh, strange statements that uh, at first I wasn't able to uh, really put into any kind of logical order, um, but later on it began to make sense why he was making these comments. Um, I picked him up. I got a call about oh, 11.30, maybe 11.15, the morning of the bombing from Presbyterian Hospital. Um, they said Terry had been injured and I need to come down there and get him. Um, in that two hour time, I've been trying to find him. Um, his, uh, his computer in his uh, police vehicle was not uh, working. Nobody could get a hold of him. Nobody seemed to know where he was. So I was really concerned because uh, I knew he worked that area early in the morning. So I was concerned um, and was relieved to get the call. So I went down there to Presbyterian Hospital, picked him up. Um, the strange thing was um, his first statement that came out of his mouth was, get me out of this hospital. No matter what you got to do, get me out of here. Um, I said, okay. Um, yeah, he's very adamant. I, I didn't know at the time that, um, that I've been told later that he was threatened at the hospital. Uh, I didn't know where the source of threatening came, uh, but that's, that's what I've been told later on, about a year after his death. Um, as soon as we got in the vehicle, um, and Terry had injured his back carrying Randy Ledger out of the building. Uh, Randy was a large man, probably uh, almost 300 pounds, and he had fallen through some rubble. Um, so he couldn't even walk, couldn't sit up. And uh, as soon as they loaded him into the car, uh, he got very upset, um, started to cry a little bit, and said, uh, Tanya, it's not what they're saying it is. They're not telling the truth. They're lying about what's going on down there. And um, yeah, I did try to press him a little bit, ask him questions, but he didn't seem very willing to talk about it. Um, it, it was just kind of a, a comment. You know, it's not what it's not what they're portraying it to be. Um, from that point on, uh, it was about two or three days later uh, after the bombing. He had asked me to take him down to the site. Um, and mind you, Terry couldn't even walk. He really was not in any shape to go down there. Um, but he kept insisting we needed to go back down there. Uh, said that we needed to go at night when we could not be seen. Um, people would just recognize us easily. Uh, I didn't understand the reason for that, but I didn't ask a lot of questions either because he just, he just seemed unwilling to give a lot of information. Um, we did go down there, uh, probably between 9.30, 10 o'clock. And he said that we were going to go look underneath 
where the daycare had been. Um, there was something he wanted to see under there and get a picture if possible. Um, as we went down there, um, we were stopped. And I can't remember which personnel it was, but I know definitely it was either ATF or FBI. I just cannot recall what the uh, name was on the back of his jacket, but it was one of the two. And um, Terry had attempted to badge his way through, and the guy told him no. Um, and he said something a little more specific, like, uh, you know you're not supposed to be back down here. Something along the lines that made me realize the two of them recognized each other, and the interaction was very antagonistic. Um, I think had I not been with Terry, he would have said a little more to the man, um, and maybe been a little more forceful about getting through, but it seemed like he thought better about it since I was with him, and we left. And then he uh, asked me as we got in the car that I not be seen down at the site, as Tanya describes it, Yakey's state on the drive home was one of intense distress, far beyond the exhaustion from his injuries. It was as though he had seen something in the rubble that had shaken him to his core. Once out of the hospital, he confided in Tanya, claiming it's not what they're saying it is. They're lying about what's going on down there. In the days that followed, Yakey's unease only deepened Though he was barely able to walk, he insisted on returning to the bomb site at night, under cover of darkness, to avoid being seen. At the site, Yakey led Tanya toward the area beneath where the daycare had been, a spot he seemed particularly drawn to, though he wouldn't say why. Before they could get close, a law enforcement official stopped them. The officer's words made it clear Yakey had no business being there. Despite his initial insistence, he eventually withdrew. As they got back into the car, he urged her to avoid being seen at the site again. It was the beginning of a powerful transformation in Yakey. He would become a man haunted by questions that would ultimately bring him face to face with something he could not escape. His friends and colleagues began to notice changes in him following the bombing. Yakey had enjoyed his time lecturing students as part of the D.A.R.E. program, but one of his close lecturers, Sergeant Mozilla Hurt, remarked, He always kept people laughing. That's why you didn't know he was hurting. Fellow officer Jim Ramsey told the press that he was a close friend and partner of Yakey's, though Tanya, Yakey's ex-wife, would later contest this claim. According to Ramsey, he and Yakey attended a mandatory counseling session together after the bombing. However, Yakey chose not to pursue additional support afterward, wary of the department's stance on mental health. In a letter to a friend, Yakey revealed that a chaplain he had spoken to reported on him to superiors, recommending that Yakey be relieved of his duties, a claim that Tanya later confirmed. This perceived betrayal deepened Yakey's mistrust, leading him to keep his suspicions to himself as he quietly continued his investigation. Tanya Yakey recalls what happened two weeks after the bombing. Um, about 15 days after the bombing happened, I got a call from his supervisor, Lieutenant Joanne Randall. And um, she's been pretty hostile, uh, pretty aggressive. And... Um, asked me where Terry was, told her he, he was not there. And she, ta she said, uh, you tell Terry that if he doesn't get that other report in, um, that he's gonna be reprimanded if he does not get that in by the end of the night. Who was this? This is Lieutenant Joanne Randall. Mm -hmm. And this was his, uh, his supervisor, direct supervisor at the time. Now, um, let, me, let me give you a little filler in there. Um, in this time frame, Terry had written a nine page report um, I know that he wrote a nine-page report. I saw it. This is the only report, however, that I've ever asked him to read that he did not let me. Um, I, I didn't understand the reason for that at the time. It was, you know, I've, I've ridden with my husband, you know, on ride-alongs. We, we talk a lot about what had happened at work. You know, I've, I've read reports about the prostitutes on Nine of Francis, you know. I mean, just meaning that nothing was really all that sacred. You know, if I asked about it, usually he was pretty forthcoming in telling me about it. Uh, this time it was an absolute no. He didn't want me reading this nine-page report. Um, and that's an awfully long report. I don't ever know. <laughs> Uh, too many uh, police incident reports that are that long, but his was. 
you, as you look back on that, do you find that as a, his way of protecting you by making sure that you didn't have that knowledge? Uh, that's what I believe. That is what I believe. At the time, it was strange to me, but uh, two years later, it, it comes into perspective really clear that he did not want me to know, have any knowledge of what was going on down there. Okay, so now she wants a second report. She wants a second report. And like I said, this is not hearsay. I got the call. I know what she said to him. Um, he had told me, and I want to say it was maybe, oh, about the 11th or 12th day that he had um, came into the house and was really upset, just mad, um, said that they supposedly lost his first report. It was just missing. Um, he was furious. And um, another thing that was very unlike him, that he would not keep a copy of the report, but I think because he had been injured and probably was not expecting that the report would come up missing, I think he probably would have made a copy under normal circumstances. Um, but he seemed offended, and he had said that she wanted him to write a much shorter report. It, you know, it needed to be one page. Um, he was being dictated, obviously, what to write in his report and being told to take a lot of things out now, of it. Now, now the people have to understand that when you turn a report in, the first thing it does, it goes to, re to, to your supervisor, then it goes to records division, and they make multiple copies for various locations. So to lose the report, the supervisor would have to lose it, or they would have to go to these multiple locations that they know the report's at and get rid of all the reports. All right. Now, they want a second report. That lends me to believe that they want a different report because they've already threatened him by now. Yes. And so now they say, that's not the report we want. You'll write it, but you'll leave out such and such. That's my theory. Tanya's recounting indicates that Yakey's original comprehensive report had been disappeared. His supervisors were exerting pressure on him to write a far briefer report, presumably to withhold certain details that had originally been included. Shockingly, this wasn't the only report that had been disappeared. Another former Oklahoma Police Department official, Steve Vassar, was friends with Yakey and on site before and after the bombing. Vassar claims to have seen McVeigh's rider truck moments before the blast, and he recalled, As God is my witness, there were two people in that van. The second suspect will be explored later in this video. Vassar wrote this in supplemental reports about the bomb but he was never questioned by investigators. When he searched for his report years later, he couldn't find it in the database. They were not in the system, as if I never was there. Yakey had become withdrawn from his fellow officers, but he wasn't entirely isolated. He met Ramona McDonald, a local businesswoman who volunteered to help in the aftermath of the bombing. She participated in a local nonprofit known as Heroes of the Heart, and her home became a meeting place for members where photos and other documents from survivors were collected. Ramona claims to have had a copy of Yakey's original nine-page report. As Yakey continued his investigation, he shared information with McDonald. The following is a letter written by Yakey. Dear Ramona, I hope that whatever you hear now and in the future will not change your opinions about myself or others with the Oklahoma City Police Department. Although some of the things I'm about to tell you are very disturbing, I don't know if you recall everything that happened that morning or not, so I'm not sure if you know what I am referring to. The man that you and I were talking about in the pictures I have, I made the mistake of asking too many questions as to his role in the bombing and was told to back off. I was told by several officers he was an ATF agent who was overseeing the bomb plot, and at the time the photos were taken, he was calling in his report of what had just went down. I think my days as a police officer are numbered because of the way my supervisors are acting, and there are a lot of secrets floating around now about my mental state of mind. I think they are going to write me up because of my ex-wife and a VPO. I told you about talking to Chaplain Poe. Well, he wrote me up in a report, stating I should be relieved of my duties. I made the mistake of thinking that a person's conversation with a chaplain was private, which by the way, might have cost me my job as a police officer. A friend at headquarters told me that Poe sent out letters to everyone in the department. Joanne Randall is up to something, and I think it has something to do with Poe. If she gets her way, 
they will tar and feather me. Knowing what I know now, and understanding fully just what went down that morning, makes me ashamed to wear a badge from Oklahoma City's police department. I took an oath to uphold the law and to enforce the law to the best of my ability. This is something I cannot honestly do and hold my head up proud any longer if I keep my silence as I am ordered to do. There are several others out there who saw what we saw and even some who played a role in what happened that day. My guess is, the more time an officer has to think about the screw-up, the more he is going to question what happened. Can you imagine what would be coming down now if that had been our officers who had let this happen? Because it was the feds that did this and not the locals is the reason it's okay. You were right all along, and I am truly sorry I doubted you and your motives about recording history. You should know that it is going to be one hell of a fight. Everyone was behind you until you started asking questions as I did as to how so many federal agents arrived at the scene at the same time. I worry about you and your young family because of some of the statements that have been made towards me, a police officer. Whatever you do, don't confront McPherson with the bomb squad about what I told you. His actions and defensiveness towards the bombing would make any normal person think he was defending himself as if he drove the truck up to the building himself. I'm not worried for myself, but for you and your group. I would not be afraid to say at this time that you and your family could be harmed if you get any closer to the truth. At this time, I think for your well-being, it is best for you to distance yourself and others from those of us who have stirred up too many questions about the altering and falsifying of the federal investigation's reports. I truly believe there are other officers like me out there who would not settle for anything but the truth. It is just a matter of finding them. The only true problem as I see it is who do we turn to then? It is vital that people like you and others keep asking questions and demanding answers for the actions of our federal government and law enforcement agencies that knew beforehand and participated in the cover-up. Even if I tried to explain it to you the way it was explained to me, and the ridiculous reason for having our own police departments falsify reports to their fellow officers, to the citizens of the city, and to our country, you would understand why I feel the way I do about all of this. I am sad to say that I believe my days as a police officer are numbered because of all of this. Sometime after the bomb, Ramona McDonald claims two men arrived at her home, identifying themselves as part of a task force investigating the bombing. They presented as official agents, though they offered no credentials, and McDonald recalls the visit as unnervingly thorough. Over the course of several hours, the men methodically examined her evidence, poring over every photograph and document she had. During their visit, McDonald observed the men's intense interest in items that appeared to challenge the official story. As they scrutinized the collection, she recalls a subtle but unshakable sense of surveillance, not the overt protection an investigation should convey, but rather a watchful, almost predatory intent. In the days following their visit, McDonald discovered that some of her materials were missing, the most notable absence was Yakey's nine-page report, the same one he had written immediately after the bombing. She never saw the report again. The disappearance of her materials fueled her suspicion that something was being suppressed. However, McDonald wasn't the only one to experience these strange occurrences. There was lots of strange, our cars were coming up vandalized, the house was coming up vandalized, he and I both were coming up on four sets of flats, like several times. I mean, we had people put nails in our tires, breaking our back windows. Just strange, bizarre little things that I wouldn't have, you know, put in place with the bombing as any kind of retaliatory activity. But after his death, it continued, okay? Um, Terry kept saying during the year that we had been being monitored by the police department. I didn't understand why anybody would be monitoring him. And you have to bear in mind that you know, what I know at this point, I did not know at the time it was occurring. Tanya moved several times following the bombing. 
with one source claiming she moved up to five times in three years. But the vandalism continued. In the weeks leading up to his death, Yakey had become increasingly paranoid. He began showing up at Tanya's house in the early morning hours. She remembered him saying, we need to get remarried. Don't ask me questions. This is the only way I can make sure you and the girls are taken care of in the event that something happens to me. Two days before his death, Terry Yakey arrived at Tanya's home unannounced. In his hands, he held a VCR. This would be the last time she saw him alive. The following is an excerpt of Tanya recalling that last unsettling visit. Two days before it, um, he showed up again and he did something very strange. He tossed a VCR in my car, did not explain why, um, said that he needed to get these insurance papers to me and, and left, said he would be back. Very upset. Um, 48 hours later, he was dead. It was the last time I ever saw it. Now, you said VCR is in a machine or a VHS tape? No, a VCR machine, an okay. entire right. machine. Okay. Which, like I said, if, if, if it were you, you know, you'd think, what in the world? What, what, what is he doing? Yeah, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a camcorder. It was a v, VCR. It was like VCR, and there had been a tape in it, but I had not watched it. The VCR came up missing within 24 hours. Oh. It disappeared out of my house. So I was more concerned at the time of what he was talking about than I was because the VCR was kind of incidental and didn't mean a lot to me at the time. On the day of his death, Terry Yakey paid a final visit to Ramona McDonald. They sat together for coffee as Yakey spoke about an upcoming meeting that seemed to weigh heavily on him. He shared details about two men he was supposed to meet. McDonald believed the men that Yakey described were the same men who had previously visited her home. As Yakey described his plans, it was clear he was conflicted. He sensed danger, yet felt he had no choice but to go. He even decided to attend the meeting unarmed, fearing his own gun might be used against him. This, he believed, would be his chance an opportunity to finally share what he had uncovered with someone who might listen. However, one article contends this is not where Yakey ended up. This information has not been corroborated by other sources, yet it has been included here in the interest of disclosure. On the afternoon of his death, former Canadian County Sheriff Clint Bowler claimed Yakey unexpectedly arrived at his home in El Reno. His car parked erratically in the middle of the road. Bowler and his girlfriend, Kate Allen, a paramedic, ran outside to find Yakey appearing nearly unconscious, struggling to maintain his composure. Allen said that Yakey couldn't tell them his name. He was ill and anxious. His heart rate was rapid. He said he had trouble concentrating and he hadn't slept. She described his disoriented state and speculated it could stem from either emotional strain or substance abuse. According to Bowler, Yakey seemed exhausted, sick, and nauseated, with multiple prescription bottles in his car, reportedly for back pain. Despite their insistence, Yakey refused to go to the hospital. Deputies eventually took Yakey to his sister's house, and a family member collected his vehicle. Yakey's sister Vicky confirmed that he appeared unwell. She tried to help him settle, offering food that he couldn't keep down. Then, he left the home abruptly. That night, Yakey's body would be discovered in a desolate field, less than two miles away from the El Reno Federal Prison. In the aftermath of the Oklahoma City bombing, federal and state authorities began their investigation as Yakey was beginning his. A federal agent was tasked with investigating the debris that had formerly been the Ryder truck. Because VIN numbers are sometimes removed by criminals, there's a confidential vehicle identification number stamped on a hidden piece of metal in each car, and it includes the last eight digits of the 17-digit VIN. 
When authorities collected this number from a part of the axle, they discovered that the vehicle was a Ryder rental truck. After calling Ryder, they determined that it had been rented from Junction City, Kansas, where records show it had been rented by a man using the name Robert Kling. Investigators and a sketch artist were sent to the location where they interviewed four employees. Their accounts led to the development of two now infamous composite sketches. The first sketch, John Doe 1, depicted a man with short hair, a chiseled jawline, and a serious expression. Authorities began circulating the sketch almost immediately, and while canvassing a local motel, they discovered Robert Kling was Timothy McVeigh. The physical resemblance was striking, and the investigation rapidly shifted. However, a second sketch of John Doe 2 proved to be an enigma. Witnesses placed this figure at the scene alongside McVeigh on the day the truck was rented, fueling suspicions that McVeigh had another accomplice. For many, John Doe 2 represented the possibility of a broader conspiracy or perhaps a cover-up. While the investigation officially shifted its full focus onto McVeigh and his known associates, the haunting image of John Doe 2 left open a door that some, including Yankee, believed would lead to the answers authorities weren't willing to pursue. McVeigh was captured shortly after the bombing. He had fled the scene without license plates. He was traveling along I-35 when a state trooper pulled him over. During the stop, the officer noticed he was carrying a weapon, and McVeigh admitted he didn't have a permit for that state. He was arrested on that charge and connected to the bombing while in custody. One of the driver's licenses, used by McVeigh at a hotel before the bombing, led investigators to the Nichols address. They set up surveillance, and while interviewing those close to Nichols, they discovered he was close friends with McVeigh. Nichols uncovered that his property was being surveilled, and he turned himself in at the police station to ask why he appeared to be under suspicion. The FBI was called in to interrogate Nichols, and he would eventually be charged. McVeigh was sentenced to execution on June 13, 1997, and Nichols was sentenced to life in prison without parole on June 4, 1998. Nichols likely avoided the death penalty as a result of the testimony of Charles Farley, a local sporting goods rental shop worker. He testified in the courtroom that he passed by Geary Lake at the time the bomb was being built, and he saw the rider truck beside a two-ton farm truck loaded with fertilizer. He saw five men at the scene. He made eye contact with one man who he identified as Morris Wilson, a member of a local Kansas citizens militia group. His testimony left jurors with questions about a larger conspiracy, one that prevented them from unanimously agreeing on a more severe punishment. There were too many unanswered questions. For example, some skeptics and experts remain unconvinced about the blast force of McVeigh's device. Among these was Brigadier General Benton Parton, an Air Force specialist with over 25 years of experience in explosive ordnance. He argued that a truck bomb placed outside the building could not have caused such targeted destruction to the building's steel-reinforced structure. According to Parton, the explosive power required to collapse the Murrah building's columns and support beams would have had to register between 3,500 and 5,600 pounds per square inch, a force vastly exceeding the capacity of ammonium nitrate. He claimed that it would not be able to collapse the structure's critical load-bearing columns, and as a result, this could indicate that there were charges planted inside the building. Other experts echoed these suspicions, with some referencing the Athenian restaurant located 150 feet from the Murrah building. Though physically removed from the blast site, it was heavily damaged by pieces of the Federal building blown outward, a trajectory that seemed to defy the blast physics expected from a truck bomb positioned outside. Another professional blaster, Sam Groning, concurred sharing an account of detonating a 5,000-pound ANFO charge himself, an explosion which, despite its close proximity, barely affected the nearby surroundings. It could be 
that Parton arrived at his force calculations because the average compressive strength of concrete is around 4,000 PSI. This means that the concussive force required to cause the concrete to compress would need to be stronger than this to compromise the structural integrity of the building. However, after the initial blast, the compressed concrete would rapidly decompress, which would test its tensile strength, which is far lower. Even the smallest structural failures could lead to progressive collapse, which would result in catastrophic destruction. Additionally, the test blasts referred to by Parton and others were likely done in controlled settings like open fields or desert, where the blast energy could disperse freely without interference. In a setting like Oklahoma City, however, the shockwave would encounter other buildings and structures. Such obstacles could reflect and amplify the blast waves, creating unpredictable pressure loads on the Murrah Building's facade. Studies show that this reflection effect can significantly intensify a blast's force in an urban environment, a critical factor that may not have been fully captured in testing. However, this wasn't the only question. What about the sketch of John Doe 2? After investigators spoke with employees at the rental location, they canvassed the area. Joanne Van Buren, an employee at a local subway, remembered seeing McVeigh enter with two men on the day of the rental. One of the men was John Doe II. This subway had video surveillance and the FBI confiscated the tapes. However, those tapes were never released to the public. Another witness even described seeing McVeigh and a second man leaving the rider truck just minutes before the explosion adding to the suspicions that McVeigh had a companion on the day of the bombing. Rodney Johnson, a local witness, swore in testimony that he'd seen McVeigh fleeing the bomb site with the second man moments before the blast. And Dana Bradley, a survivor who had been in the Murrah Building's social security office, saw two men exiting the truck before the explosion. According to her, one of the men was olive skinned with a blue starter jacket and a white hat bearing purple flames. The explanations for why the FBI never pursued John Doe II are far-reaching. They received a deluge of tips after the catastrophe, and they were under immense political pressure to find a quick path to justice. In the wake of several previous disasters, they needed an easy win. Some claim this made investigators myopic, targeting McVeigh and Nichols and rushing to a resolution. There remains one final unanswered question. What about the ninth left leg? In the weeks following the Oklahoma City bombing, recovery teams discovered a severed left leg wearing a military-style boot and olive drab strap. Initially, officials believed it belonged to Lakeisha Levy, a 21-year-old Air Force airman who had died in the explosion. Levy's body was buried with the leg, but nearly a month later, a different left leg was discovered in the rubble. When authorities matched this new leg to Levy through DNA and footprint analysis, it became clear that the leg originally buried with her wasn't hers. So who did the first leg belong to? Despite extensive searches, no other remains were found to match the original leg. Authorities ultimately concluded that it likely belonged to an unidentified person positioned very close to the explosion whose body was almost entirely destroyed. Some have linked these open questions to form conspiracies, of which there are many that propose a federal official acted as an agent provocateur, someone undercover who may have helped foment what occurred that day and perhaps lost his life doing so. On May 8th, 1996, just over a year after the Oklahoma City bombing, the body of Sergeant Terry Yakey was discovered in a remote field near El Reno, Oklahoma. At around 6 p.m. that day, police located Yakey's maroon Ford Probe parked off Fort Reno Road. The car was locked with the windows rolled up, 
containing his empty holster, a Bible with a photograph of him rescuing someone from the ruins, and a razor. Blood had soaked the car's interior as though he had sustained serious injuries, yet Yakey's body was eventually discovered nearly half a mile away in a secluded field near a small grove of trees. The first responders from Canadian County observed the unsettling nature of Yakey's injuries. His wrists, inner elbows, and neck were lacerated, and he had been shot through the head at a downward trajectory. Despite his body being found outside Oklahoma City's jurisdiction, the Oklahoma City Police Department assumed control of the investigation, and Canadian County officers reported being ordered off-site within an hour. The exact details of the investigation have been withheld, and a full report has never been released. The brief, incomplete report made available did not even confirm whether a gun was present at the scene. An autopsy was reportedly waived as authorities cited the clear cause of death. Less than 24 hours later, the department ruled Yakey's death a suicide. His ex-wife, Tanya, reported that her contacts within law enforcement said his body showed bruises and rope burns consistent with handcuffing and restraint. When Tanya and Yakey's mother viewed his body at the funeral home, they saw the bruising at the wrists and ankles. Dirt and grass were embedded in his wounds, suggesting he had been dragged. They recalled that his head was severely swollen and disfigured, which they suspected came from physical trauma, but others have suggested this could have been embalming fluid leaked from broken blood vessels in his head. Following Yakey's death, friends and family reported unnerving events. Tanya and his sister, Lashawn Hargrove, described being followed by unfamiliar vehicles, hearing strange clicks on their phone lines, and feeling a constant sense of surveillance. Ramona McDonald reported that her home had also been burglarized, with photos and documents she had kept related to the bombing mysteriously disappearing. Despite recent journalistic attention, the Oklahoma City Police Department retained their official ruling, but for those closest to Yakey, the evidence points to something far more sinister. To this day, his family and friends continue to search for answers. On April 19, 1995, Terry Yakey searched through blood, dust, and devastation, finding life where others had perished. But his search didn't end when he left those ruins. In the months that followed, he continued to search finding only an ever-growing darkness. He became a man haunted, drawn into the depths of a nightmare he could not shake, compelled by a need to understand what others could not or would not. In the end, his journey left him in a desolate field, silent and alone. And in his wake, his family and friends are left haunted too, burdened by more questions than answers. Heroism is the courage to confront torment, the willingness to walk into darkness with no promise of return. In his relentless search, Terry left behind only fragments of a story, a reminder that the path to truth is neither straight nor safe. His story serves as a stark reminder that some truths lie buried beneath a weight too heavy to lift that those who dig too deep may risk being buried alongside them.